Well, welcome back, and uh, welcome if you weren't here before. And uh, this sermon will actually tie in just a little bit with the last one, only by God's design. Uh, the main thrust is not the same, but it is related. So let's pray, ask God to bless us, and open His Word. Father, thank you for this beautiful main day, for all the work that's gone into this camp meeting, uh, for the shade of this tent, the amplification of my voice, and the fellowship we can share together. Now, Lord, we're praying in humility for your spirit to be here and to speak to us so that we can hear what you have to say to the church. Now, Lord, I, I do pray, anoint our hearts and minds, my lips, my tongue, and mind, and guide us in the word, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. This morning, I'm going to pick back up on there as a fountain. I'm going to read the quote to you again. By beholding, you become changed. Now, some of you think that being righteous is the mark of following God, and it is. But I'm going to show you something in the Bible you've never seen. And uh, unless you've listened to me preach this sermon, I've never heard anybody else say some of these things. They're there, but I want to remind you that how you see God is how you will project onto other people. Um, I'll tell a story. Um, Robert Fulgham wrote a book entitled, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. That book is old, but he wrote some other books. One was entitled, It Was on Fire When I Lay Down on It. In one of those books, he told a story called Woman's Reality Test. He was working in the Feather River Inn in Northern California, and it was owned by a Jewish man, and one of the workers there was a Holocaust survivor. His name was Woolman. He describes Woolman as looking like a bloodhound, never smiling. And every night when he got off of working the front desk, he'd always go down to the kitchen. And when he'd go down to the kitchen, he'd open the refrigerator, and the same thing was there every night, wieners and schnitzel. And he said, you know, I'm sick and tired of working in this two-bit, flea-bitten hotel. All they ever have down here for me to eat is wieners and schnitzel. And about that time, uh, Woolman walks in, Holocaust survivor. He looks at Fulgham and he says, Fulgham, you know what your problem is? You don't know the difference between a problem and an inconvenience. He said, if your house is on fire or your neck is broken, you've got a problem. He said, everything else is just an inconvenience. And of course, coming from a Holocaust survivor, he said, I felt like I just got kicked in the stomach. He said, writing to close out his book, and a lot of these authors a lot of them were raised by pastors. They're very religious. They were very religious at one point in time in their life. He said, Woolman taught me the difference between a lump in the oatmeal, a lump in the throat, and a lump in the breast. Now, I'm here to tell you as leaders of God's church, and I believe you're here because you've chosen to prioritize spiritual things, we need leaders who have exceptionally good judgment. Because sometimes we think the mark of our righteousness is holding up the standard. Now listen, let there be no doubt. I am a principled, and for lack of better terms, conservative Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And I really do believe that without a journey to holiness... I said a journey to holiness. There's not going to be the sweet pleasure of Christ's company. But I do find in the Bible that God has worked with a lot of people in a lot of situations to get them where he wants them to be. And I'm going to tell you a story this morning that's a bit similar. So I want you to remember something. 
God repeats one of the 20-some thousand verses in the Bible two times in the New Testament. I want to show you which one it is. Now take your Bibles, if you would, and open them, if you would, to the book of Hosea. Now there's 23,145 verses in the Old Testament. That's 23,145. I've got it written right here in the front of my Bible. And I'm going to show you the one verse in the New Testament, in the four Gospels, that is used two times. Now, this is not an exhaustive study, so I'm not here to say there wouldn't be any others, but in my reading, none have jumped out. So go to the book of Hosea, little Old Testament book, not too much after Daniel there, right next book. And I want to read a verse that Jesus will quote in Matthew 9 and a verse that Jesus will quote in Matthew 12. It says here in verse 6, I think my wife, uh, Hosea 6, verse 6, I think my wife found my sermon. That's nice. I won't have to go just on memory. That's okay. This is my wonderful wife, Colleen. Some of you have wondered who she is. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. It says, For I delight in mercy rather than sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now take your Bible and go over to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 9. Now I was in India on a mission trip, and I wasn't feeling the best. At least part of the trip I wasn't. But every morning I was reading through the book of Matthew. And so as I'm reading through the book of Matthew, I come to chapter 9, verse 13. And there's a paralytic that's been healed, and Matthew has been called. And of course, Matthew was one of those dreaded tax collectors. And they were hated. I want to tell you, they were hated. They were almost as bad as the Samaritans because they were traitors. And somehow the religion of the day had the ins and the outs. And after he called Matthew in verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, Matthew 9, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and the sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now go over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. So imagine I'm reading in my Bible, and as I'm reading, I'm thinking to myself, I just read that. Now in Matthew chapter 12, you have Jesus and his disciples who are hungry at the end of a Sabbath day. And his disciples pluck a little bit of grain, and they're threshing it between their hands. And the Pharisees say, that's work. And Jesus is grieved about the small-mindedness of the leaders of the church. And he said to them in verse 3, have you not read what David did when he became hungry? He and his companions, how he entered the house of God, and they ate the consecrated bread, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who with him, but for the priest alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and they're innocent? But I say to you, something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy or compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. And then the famous verse for Adventists is verse 8, for the Lord, Son of Man, is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, when there's 23,145 verses to choose from, and you have 80 or 90 chapters of the gospel story with a few thousand verses, why do you take this one? How does the Holy Spirit move on Matthew's heart of all the stories to include, and include this one. Now, 
If Jesus could take of those 23,145 verses and highlight this one, it's possible that this one might be a little more important than some of the rest. And what I want to say to you at the beginning of this sermon is illustrated best by this story. And maybe you've heard it before. Years ago, there was a preacher that was sitting on a car pulled by a steam engine. And as he was sitting there, the seat next to him was empty. And a man came in and sat down next to the preacher. And the preacher was reading a book. I don't know what it was. It wasn't the Bible because the man didn't know he was a preacher. A little bit later, the man reaches into one of his bags and he pulls out a bottle of liquor. And he turns to the preacher and he says, would you like a drink? And the pastor says to him, no, thank you. I'm a Christian and I don't drink. And the man looked at him a little bit. It became clear that he was a preacher. And he said to the preacher, he said, I bet you must think I'm a vile person. And the preacher said, no, on the contrary, I was thinking what a generous man you are. Now, I want to get the point across. How do you see people? Now, I said it in a sermon the other day, but I want to say it again. There are two different standards for how we relate to people. There's the family standard, which ought to be family discussed. And then there's the standard for others who haven't been brought into the family yet. Until you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all of His laws are largely irrelevant in your life, and they're mainly condemnatory. Once you're in the family, though, we still need to see people with the eyes of Christ's love. And I'm here to tell you, the devil's picking on our teenagers. He's trying to destroy them when they're young. He's trying to get a hold of them and sink them in the beginning. We as Christians have a right to talk to them. Now I'm going to tell you another story. Back when I was young, I've learned all my best things about pastoring from the members, by the way. Could somebody say amen? amen. And, and thank you for all those churches where you take the younger pastors and you love them and you're patient and you teach them. And some of us older pastors, we still need you to be patient. For us too? But I was standing in the back of that Monticello church, the one I just preached about, where they didn't want to buy, they gave me the 13-inch TV. That became the sweet, that became my Philippi, by the way. <laughs> it doesn't always end like it starts. I'm, sit, I'm standing there in church. It's before the Sabbath school starts. And sitting in her spot, her regular spot, she's always there before anybody else on Sabbath is Beulah Crawl. Are there any Beulahs in the audience today? Do you know any Beulahs younger than anybody in the audience today? <laughs> Beulah is not a name that's been in for a little while. I think it means heaven, doesn't it? Heavenly? Married too. Yep, beloved. Um, you know, she came early and she sat in that church every Sabbath morning. And one day this kid comes in. I think he had cowboy boots on and jeans and a checkered shirt, no tie. He wasn't coming to church. He was just coming to church. He knew where Beulah was every Sabbath. I want to tell you, friends, it's just like that man that was largely blind and largely deaf. When they asked him, why do you go to church every Sabbath? He said, because I want the devil to know whose side I'm on. <laughs> come to church. You never know. And when you come to church, come as a missionary. Everybody at church is somebody you're to be looking out for. Don't come expecting anything from anybody. Come planning to give something to people course, you don't always come that way. That's why there needs to be the rest of you ready to pour out a drink of life to somebody. But do it for the people you see every week. So this guy comes into church, and he sits down next to Beulah. Well, hey, this is all happening in front of me. I've got permission to eavesdrop. They know I'm right there. I'm going to stand right there and listen. And they start talking to each other. And pretty soon, the weirdest thing happens. Beulah looks at him, and we'll call him Johnny. Beulah looks at him and says, Johnny, are you still smoking? <laughs> hey, Beulah can get away with it. <laughs> this, is, this is what you can get away with, friends. You an older, loving person, you can get away with stuff nobody else can get away with. She looks at him, and she says, Johnny, are you still smoking? And he hangs his head. Yes. Well, you know, you know son, you need to stop doing that. <laughs> 
Now listen. The more loving you are, the more beautiful and like Christ you are, the more you can deliver the wounds of a friend. But I want you to know something. Beulah could have just let him walk off, but she was a mother in Israel. And she was prompted by the Holy Spirit. And she exercised her social power. To, she told him, he knew she was loved, that he, that he was loved by her. Grandmotherly lady. He probably came to all those little Sabbath school classes when she was vigorous enough to teach them. But now she's at church. I learned so much from Beulah. I'll tell you something else I learned from Beulah. Sidebar, doesn't really have anything to do with the story, but I like to tell it. There was an older lady in my church, wealthy lady. By the way, I just preached on money. This wealthy lady ran into me in Walmart, and she said, Pastor, I want you to know something. She said, I will never try to control you with my money. I'm telling you, ooh, that's the Spirit of God moving on somebody's heart. But she died. Her name was Alice. She was married to a non adventist name was Danny. Danny fell in love with someone else. And, uh, you know, I didn't know some of this stuff when I was young. And I was young. And uh, Danny, you know, a generation or two ago, we used to teach, we still do, that we're to avoid the appearance of evil. Amen? Yeah. Well, Danny wasn't doing that. Danny was spending the night at his new girlfriend's house. He's probably 80 years old. He told me he was sleeping on the couch. Well, other people must have found out about it. And Beulah found out about it. And one day, Beulah was talking to me, and she said, Pastor, you know what they used to say in my day? It's not far from the couch to the bedroom. Now, I want you all to think about it. You older people have a lot of wisdom. You older people, us older people, <laughs> stay young in your head, friends. Stay young in your head all the way to the end. You, we, have the prerogative to say and be and do, which makes up for our absence maybe of energy. We traded in our energy on experience. Now we have some wisdom. Hopefully, we become more loving. Did you know there's two things that people are always going to need? They're always going to need to be loved and encouraged, and sick people are always going to need to get better, which is why the doctors and the pastors got to be real close to each other. Ellen Weiss said the worst evil to come upon the church is the separation of the doctors and the pastors. I think we've forgotten that. And by the way, we're supposed to be looking to minister through the selective blessed benefit of inspiration about how to treat the human body in ways that it will respond to without lots of expensive and sometimes deleterious drugs. But I don't want to keep deviating. Social power is exceptionally important because God said it's not good that we should be what? Now, we know Jesus went out by himself, according to the book of Mark, to be by himself, but he was really with God. But it's interesting that National Public Radio uh, was reporting not long ago that it's, work is harder than it used to be. Some of you are business owners. It's hard to get people to show up and come to work. But I want to tell you something. Socializing is harder than it used to be because people aren't going to the work it takes to learn to do it. Now... Full disclosure, when I was growing up, my mother said to me, you're going to be a scientist because I was quite reserved. And when I took my aptitude test, they said, you're going to be an engineer. I was good with spatial relations and problem, solve, problem solving. But God said, oh, no, he's not. He's going to be a pastor. And I used to think as a young man, why would anybody ever want me to come to their house to see them anyway? And you know, my wife had to prompt me. And then God basically put something in my heart that got me over the hurdle. And it was a four-letter word. It was called L-O-V-E. 
And all you got to do is start loving somebody, and then all of a sudden you're thinking about yourself a little bit less. Now, my dad was the consummate, I don't want to use the wrong word. He was very reserved. He wasn't a recluse. But he was, he was stressed in social environments. You have to know that's half of my DNA came from him. Now, there's nothing I love much more after my family than being with the family of God now. But I used to wonder, why would anybody want to see me? But through the years, I've changed. And some of you may need to change. Because what I want to talk with you about right now is social power. There's nobody that comes to your church, whether they're LGBTQ, backslidden on a whole nother line, social financial cheat like Zacchaeus, whom we're about to talk about, or, or Matthew, who wrote this book. And Jesus basically said to them, You'll get a whole lot farther if you'll show them a little mercy instead of holding up the law of God. They already know they're guilty. Did you know, friends, there's an inner witness in all of us? And you know what it tells us when we do something wrong? You did something wrong. Even the heathen have some sense because the voice of God speaks through the inner witness. And what I want to tell you today is when somebody shows up at your church, they've already overcome a dozen hurdles to even get there, and they're almost expecting to be rejected because they got tattoos all over them or rings in their nose or whatever it might be, or they smell like smoke. But when God trusts your church enough to send you somebody who had to come over a bunch of hurdles to get there, my hope is that they'll find out it was the best decision they ever made because they just ran into a whole bunch of people like Jesus. Go and learn what this means. Now, that's not permission to lower all the standards. All right? Spoiler alert. Jesus never lowered any of the standards. <laughs> he actually paid the price for all the ones that weren't met by dying on Calvary. Jesus showed that the highest standard is to love people. And by the way, it's way more inconvenient to love people than it is to teach them 28 fundamental beliefs. One night I was driving from Noblesville home and I had to go through Cicero and I lived in Arcadia. So I drove right by my church and right by the academy in Indiana. It's dark, it's late, it's winter. I had been doing something with my other church in Noblesville. And as I drive down the road, there's a guy walking along the side of the road. It's cold, it's dark, I'm by myself. I'm not a little man but I'm still not excited about picking somebody up in the middle of the night when it's cold and it's dark and I just want to go home. So I drove right on by him. I got all the way into Cicero and the Lord kept saying, are you going to ignore me? Are you going to go all the way home and then get home and not did what I said and say, I'm sorry for not doing what you're saying? And I surrendered and I said, no, Lord, I'm not going to do that. And I stopped the car. I turned around and went back and picked him up. You know who he was? He was just an ordinary guy, actually going to work at the convenience store gas station. He didn't have a way to get there. He's walking from the mobile home park, and it was cold, and it was dark, and he still had a mile or so to go. Oh, it's super inconvenient to love people, because they'll call you while you're trying to eat, while you're trying to sleep, while you're on vacation, while you're trying to do all kinds of other things, and it would be easier just to say, not messing with it. And by the way, the job of pastoring is very difficult because it can be very wonderful, and most of mine has been. But when it's difficult, it's difficult because you don't work eight to five. I once had a lady say in front of my whole church, my wife and I were just talking about this. She said, Ron, that's impacted you very negatively. <laughs> she worked in the conference. I'm sure she did not mean to twist this like this, but she said, she was basically talking about how lazy some pastors were. She says, yeah, you call his house, he's always there. What was the message that got through to my young mind? You're not going to find me at home. <laughs> I'm going to be out working. I didn't want to do this job anyway. And the last thing I wanted is somebody dissing me for not working. But you know, the next night I was driving from the same place to the same place, and guess what? Same guy was walking along the road. Wasn't hard to stop and pick him up the next time. You see, the Holy Spirit speaks to His people. And while you may sometimes get the message wrong, which is why we go to, we go to heaven together, sometimes you need to say, oh, hey, you know the, 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 the signer who fixed my collar for me? 
I was at a camp meeting in Indiana once, and I was in the bathroom in the music building, and a man in a black suit came out of one of the stalls. He had a coat, he had the short, the, the pants, he had a black suit, and he had a white toilet paper trail about this long behind him. I saw him and I thought, hmm, I don't know that guy, but he's going to walk out of this bathroom and every kid on this camp is going to laugh at him until somebody who cares about him says, uh, excuse me. So I thought to myself, since the wounds of a friend can be trusted, I'm going to do this right now in this bathroom. And I said, excuse me, but you might want to step back in the stall and take care of something. Love is extremely inconvenient and amazingly powerful. There's no substitute for it. There's no program that makes up for it. God speaks to his children, and if they learn to listen, they get to see the fruits of love come to life. We recently had an immersion program at our church. That's a 10-day health reset. We had two people that were non avis come. I met the one guy at Great Clips. It took about six months of phone tag, but I knew he needed this. At the end of that immersion program, we had a lady come. She's had drug addiction issues. She couldn't hardly stand to look at you. But I'm here to tell you the social power, the spiritual happiness of that group of medical missionaries working with that lady, the new things she learned about how to take control of her life, hope in her head. I've never seen a more holistic healing in somebody's life than I've ever seen in this lady. She comes to church now. She comes to prayer meeting now. She came over and examined our new project next to the church. She's happy. She's healed. She's healing. It's both. And you know why? Because the social power of love in a family touched her with the truth. And now she's keeping the Sabbath and nobody had to twist her arm to do it. We are her people now. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody needs to be loved. The child who's raised by the elder, who's decided he's had enough of this, he still needs to be loved. You don't love him when his parents say, hey, you got to, let's be clear about what love is. I've seen a lot of things. If mom and dad are reasonable people and they say to their 17-year-old, you can live here, but you got to live by the rules, and he says, I'm out of here. It's not the job of the next elder to say, well, come live at my house. I'm a nicer guy than your mom and dad. Please don't do that kind of stuff. That's not love. If there's something unreasonable in the parents, somebody should sit down and talk with them. That's love. And by the way, I've got myself in more trouble doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly than anything else I've ever done. But I can't oversee dysfunction when it's staring me in the face or slapping me in the face. But I can't practice a false sentimentalism in order to tell somebody, I'm okay, you're okay, and your parents are just lost their, their marbles. I once had to have my son go live somewhere else. My oldest son is just like me. <laughs> oh, boy. He's got a mouth, and he's smart, and he likes to argue. Now, I hope that I have some of that, and I don't really want to argue. But I told him, if you keep talking to me like this, I'm going to call up the elder. Now, this is how you can do it if you're an elder. We had an elder in my church named uh, Chuck and his wife, Ramona. These were the most consummate. They were farmers, best people. I said, if you keep talking to me like that, you're not going to be able to live here. You're going to need to go live with Chuck and Ramona. Well, finally, one day, he crossed the line. I still know Chuck and Ramona's phone number, 317-984-3248. That's probably still their phone number. They're still alive. They're in their 80s. He saw me pick the phone up. Oh, no, Dad, please don't do that. Oh, please, please, please. You can go complain to them about how bad I am. I actually drove him there. He was a completely different kid on the way. <laughs> it's funny how we take advantage of our parents. He was there for a day or two. These people loved me. They knew I was reasonable along with my wife. He stayed there for a day or two. And then finally, it's like, all right, it's a privilege to live at my house. You want to come home? I'm not talking about us dividing the camp because we've got sentimentalism going on. That's the least person I am. But I want you to know there's a difference between a lump in the oatmeal, a lump in the throat, and a lump in the breast. And if ever we needed wisdom, we sure need it today. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. We're to be the most merciful people in the world. 
We're to see people like that preacher saw that drunk. We're supposed to see through the eyeglasses of God. We're supposed to see the potential of every human being. When Jesus looks at you and he looks at me, he doesn't see us for what we are. He sees us for what we can be. Glory, hallelujah. And that's how we're supposed to see people. Now, you need to know, in Luke chapter 18 and 19, you have the story of these two people that were well-to-do. The first one's the story of a rich young ruler. Let's turn there. Luke chapter 18 and 19. In Luke chapter 18 and 19, we have two rich men that relate to Jesus completely differently. In Luke 18, we have the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus, says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He kneels down in front of Jesus. The Bible says he loved Jesus. The Bible says Jesus loved him. He said, keep the commandments. Is that legalism or is that liberty? It's the perfect law of liberty. And if love for God motivates it, the law can't save you, but it can protect you. Listen to me, friends. You can't take the mirror and rub the marks off your face, but you can see you need to go to the one who can. We don't live without either one. But when Jesus quoted all the commandments, he left the last one out. All of the six, except thou shalt not covet. And the man said, I've kept all these since my youth. And Jesus said, well, there's only one thing that's lacking. You love your money more than you love people. And I know how to fix that. Start giving your money away to the people that need it and come follow me. And the man's countenance just changed. And then he told his disciples, it's harder for a rich man to go to heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, I'm not of the persuasion that the eye of the needle is something the camels had to kneel down and go through in Jerusalem. But for those preachers that preach that, I'm okay with it. I just happen to think that Jesus actually meant that you might get the hair off an eyelash of a camel through the eye of a needle, but it's not happening. And they said, Lord, how can this be? Because every religious leader they knew was well-to-do. Well, the answer is in the next chapter. Turn over to chapter 19. Verse 1, he entered Jericho and he was passing through. There was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see Jesus, who he was, and he was unable to because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. Well, that's a little bit of an understatement. It wasn't just because he was short, because my guess is there were a lot of kids who got to see Jesus that day. It's because nobody liked him. It's because nobody wanted to do him a favor. It's because he had extorted people. It's because he was a traitor and he was rich. Now, what they didn't know was the Holy Spirit was speaking to this man. He wasn't happy. His life was empty. And he just wanted to see if the face of Jesus matched up with what he had heard about him. Now, think about that. You know, Abraham Lincoln used to say, you know, by the time you're a certain age, the way your face looks is your own fault because you've held it in that, you've held it in that image for so long. You know, sometimes I see people, I've seen them at the hotel I'm staying at, just smile at them. And they'll know something's going on in your life that's a little bit different because everybody's so used to looking at their phone and not making eye contact. Yeah, social work's harder now. Teach your kids how to shake somebody's hand, to say happy Sabbath. Teach them how to talk to each other. Teach them to show a little honor to the gray head found in the way of righteousness. Zach is an old man. He just wants to see if the atmosphere around Jesus is as beautiful as the stories are. He's been rejected. For a while, it wasn't no big deal because all of his money bought him pleasure. But remember, money is to happiness what drugs are to pleasure. Very, very temporary. And so he's smart. He solved a lot of problems. He's a boss because he's good at it. And he says to himself, I'm going to make this happen. And he, he runs to where the route is going to go. He's got his good clothes on. He doesn't care. He jumps to grab a branch. Somehow he wheels himself up into this sycamore tree. And he gets up high enough to where nobody can see him. Because he's been mocked and made fun of and derided and excluded. 
and scorned. And he's up in this tree thinking to himself, I'm going to get to at least see what he looks like. Pretty soon you can smell the dust from the crowd. Pretty soon you can hear, uh, you can hear the peas and carrots of everybody talking. Pretty soon you can see them. And pretty soon Jesus, who's being thronged. I've been to India three times. When you're done preaching, the people come up and throng you. They crowd around you and just want you to put your hand on their head and pray for them. I've never been thronged anywhere else in my life. But Jesus is moving very slowly, and Zacchaeus is trying to hone in to see what he looks like, see if he can figure out who he is. And that crowd comes closer and closer and closer until he's figured it out. That's him. He's satisfied. The stories and the person match the persona. But something terrible happens. The crowd stops at the base of the tree. Now, when you were a kid, I still do this as an adult. I live on a, I live on a dirt road. God's given me a little house back in the woods, 850 square feet with a un, mainly unfinished basement, little bitty place. But it's my little sanctuary. You can't see my house from the road. But when I walk out to the road, sometimes there's a car coming. And when I was a kid, I'd rush to jump behind a tree so no one could see me when the headlights were coming. And the other day I was out there, it's like, there's a car coming. I don't want him to see. I ran to hide. Zacchaeus is in the most vulnerable position for being made fun of in all of his life because he's revealed that being on the outside is hurting him. He's revealed that he actually has some religious interest, but he's been rejected by the religious institution, the leaders and the members, everybody. So Zacchaeus is up in this tree. And the last thing he wants is to be seen. And so he's up there and the crowd stops and his heart starts beating. I can't prove this. This is just potentially sanctified imagination based on if I was in the tree and if I had been rejected, and if I didn't want to be made fun of in front of all of Jericho. And while he's sitting there or laying across the branch, he starts thinking to himself, well, I hope they get along now. And then all of a sudden, the worst thing in the world that could happen to Zacchaeus happens. Jesus looks up in the tree, and guess what everybody else does? They look up in the tree, and there's the snickers and the laughter, and then the most amazing thing happens. The voice of Christ says, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to spend time at your house. And all of a sudden, the crowd goes silent. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. And that man starts scampering out of that tree with his good clothes on, lands in the dust, stands up and dusts himself off, and they're about to get a testimony that they couldn't believe in a thousand years was going on because they were as covetous as he was, some of them were, and they thought he had it better than them. And then he says, half of all I own I'm giving to the poor, and if I've robbed anybody, I'm giving it back multiple times over. And Jesus says, today, Salvation has come to this house. I want to tell you something. You need a good preacher. He better be a genuine, she better be a genuine man or woman. And they may not be as gifted homiletically as somebody else is, but if they're genuine and they love God, they can teach the truth. And you need good Sabbath school classes because everybody that brings their kids wants their little ones to be loved and in a safe place. But I'm going to tell you something. You better make a priority of having fellowship meals and making sure the stranger in your midst isn't the last one to go through line because you grow your church by creating belonging when you sit and talk with somebody and get to know them. My church has gone on a lot of mission trips, lots. I couldn't afford to go when I was in college. I was poor, didn't even think about it. But when I was about 34 years old, Lloyd Jacobs one of you are related. Lloyd Jacobs says to me after a board meeting, we need to go on a mission trip. Well, I thought, yeah, we need to go on a mission trip. 
Some people said, what a waste of money. Just send the money. Those people didn't know anything. I'm here to tell you, over a period of about 15 years, I took my church on probably 18 or 19 different mission trips, and I want you to know something. You can sit in church for 52 weeks and stare at the back of each other's heads, or you can go, and you can go, not or, and you can go on a mission trip and get the same amount of time working, worshiping, laughing, talking, and bonding with each other, and you can bring your church back ready to love and work together. There's a few rules on my staff at church. One is you got to like each other. Tell me how happy a family is when people don't like each other. I'm here to tell you, friends, I've watched the windows of heaven open up. I've watched my members give money. Different people write a check for $10,000 to build a church. They've been waiting for 30 years. When you actually meet that person, I want them to have a church. I've seen kids sponsor other kids to go to school in the mission field, but I'm here to tell you something. Social power is the method for today. And if you're not exercising social power in your church because you're too inconvenienced in church as an add-on, it's not a priority. The family of God is not where it's at. Jesus exercised social power. He loved. He knew the difference between a lump in the oatmeal, a lump in the throat, and a lump in the breast. And when somebody was caught in the very act of adultery, he was able to say to them, I'm not here to condemn you. I would actually just saved your life. And it's going to cost me mine. But stop doing knife that way. Live a different way. And now with love as the modus operandi, she did. And I believe she was with Jesus through the rest of his ministry. I actually believe she's Mary Magdalene. Can't prove it. But I think it's who she was. Friends, in your fellowship hall, at your table, in your home, you will grow your church. And when you have a home where people feel comfortable because you're not out to impress them, you're out to love them. When you feed them peanut butter and jelly because you couldn't send them away on Sabbath, you didn't have time to make your food, tisk tisk. but it happens to all of us. You bring them to your house and you feed them, you feed them Doritos and peanut butter and jelly because you love them and care about them and they're strangers in your midst. When we don't exercise this ministry, we should take what we get and let it be because it's super inconvenient to love somebody, and to grow a church family through the methodology of love. Christ won Zacchaeus' heart because Zacchaeus knew Jesus was different. He saw the principled beauty of a God who didn't lower the standard but lifted up the love. And when we do these two things together, what we say to the people around us is, it's wonderful to belong here, isn't it? And you may have no real particular skill. You may wonder yourself, I'm not doing much for the church. I want to tell you what. In conjunction with your pastor, don't run off and do things on your own. Communicate. Let's have some structure and order, okay? Hold a small group in your home. But if you don't have time to hold a small group, use the Sabbath lunch hour as a way to encourage and bless somebody because it's good to teach in the sermon and it's great to nurture in the Sabbath school, but you create belonging at the table. And that's what this world doesn't have. And that's where the bonds are formed. And I want you to know, when Zacchaeus was feeding everybody at his house, Jesus was rejoicing that the sinners in their midst were being won back to the truth. I don't know what the end of Zacchaeus' life was like, but I will tell you this. Emotional pain is probably the greatest pain that anybody bears. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Lie, lie, and more lies. You know how we make up our identities? Well, first in Christ, I hope. But most people get their identity shaped by another person before it's shaped by Jesus. It's shaped, hopefully, for Jesus through another person. That woman at the well, that poor lady, she had a story. Remember this, friends, as I end this message. Everybody's got a story. You know why their hair's different colors? You know why they barely have any clothes on? Everybody's got a story. There's a reason. If we can see past the outer and be a little interested in the inner, their story will change. 
because they meet the living Christ through one of you. I'm here to tell you today, social power combined with the true is the only way it works. And I want to deputize all of you to do a little more planning and actually hope God will send a stranger to your church some Sabbath and that they'll get four or five invitations to come home and eat. Yeah, it's uncomfortable to make conversation. Do it all the time, but let me tell you a trick. Just ask questions. People like to tell you about themselves usually. Just ask some questions. The missionary work of listening and caring will open the doors when all the telling in the world won't do any good. Friends, it works. Families grow slow. When they grow wise, they grow healthy and strong. And pretty soon, some of those people, just like that guy I told you about the other day who drove past his parents and yelled out, I hate you. He's preaching the gospel every Sabbath and leading people to Christ now. Where you are and where you're going, well, that's determined by who you run into and what kind of Christians they are. This morning, friends, be the ones that know the difference between a lump in the oatmeal, a lump in the throat, and a lump in the breast. And be the ones who go the extra mile. That's what Jesus said works. Imagine that Roman soldier after a mile. You know Jesus had to carry some soldier's backpack. He didn't do it begrudgingly. He took an interest in the guy while he was walking. And when they got to 5,280 feet, he said, all right, you can give it back now. And Jesus looks over at him with a smile and says, that's all right. I'll take it a second mile for you. That's why those Roman soldiers were converted. It was the power of love. Nothing can shut down love, not even the mark of the beast. God's going to win. We're on the winning side. Let's line up with the winning principles today, and may we exercise the power of social power and let the fountain of affection flow in appropriate ways from God to us, to others. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, this isn't rocket science. Thank you, thank you, thank you that it's not. And I'm praying for all my brothers and sisters here in Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont and wherever else people have come from. Help them to understand the story's not about us. The story's about you. And we'll do our best. And sometimes we may be a fool for Christ. But Lord, help us to know and remember how wonderful it feels to know we're loved by you and that we have a home in heaven. And that you're taking care of us now. And help us, Lord, to help somebody else's prodigal. Somebody else has been beaten and chewed and kicked to the curb. Help us to help somebody else realize the church is God's fortress on earth. It's a sanctuary. And now, Lord, bless all of us on this day. May we take good courage that there's a place for us to be missionaries. First at church. First at home. And Lord, may the beauty of who we are there win the hearts of all the rest who just want to see, does this Christianity really work? What's it really look like? Give them the view, Zacchaeus, God, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you. Amen.